Good evening, Calvary. Take out your Bibles. We're going through the minor prophets, so turn to the book of Nahum. I know you were just thinking about that book just the other day. I, I love going through the minor prophets. We hit on books that we wouldn't normally, you know, just be studying, so it's good. We won't spend a long time. Actually, tonight we're going to look at two books. We're going to look at Nahum and Habakkuk, or Habakkuk, however it's pronounced, however you want to pronounce it. Um, but uh, we'll look, first of all, at Nahum. And uh, let's begin with prayer. Lord, we uh, are thankful for this journey through the minor prophets. Some of these are very difficult books as they deal with so much judgment as we have in Nahum, not even dealing with God's people, but with Assyria. So we pray that you would just navigate and help us, Lord, as we study through here to understand it and why you put it here. And uh, Lord, as we look at these two books, also Habakkuk, we pray that you uh, just speak to our hearts. Give us some practical things that we can take away from here as we're studying your word tonight. We ask this in Jesus' name. We all say Amen. Uh, I was reading this week about uh, Gary Tyndale. He was in a California courtroom. He was charged with robbery. And during the permission, he asked uh, Judge Rodriguez permission to go to the bathroom. He was granted. He went into the bathroom. Of course, it was guarded on the outside. But inside the bathroom, he climbed up the plumbing and opened up a panel in the ceiling. Sure enough, there was a drop ceiling with space in between, so he crawled in the, the crawl space up there. Now, he went about 30 feet south, and the panels underneath him gave way, and he plopped onto the floor, right back into the courtroom in front of Judge Rodriguez. Needless to say, he, he did not get away without receiving judgment. And uh, really, that's the proclamation of Nahum to the Assyrians through this book. It's really a book, we'll move fairly quickly here, because I think it's self-explanatory. Um, but it was written sometime around 660 B.C., and uh, the Assyrians' wickedness and power had reached its pinnacle, and God was going to judge them. Now, if you remember about the Assyrians and their capital, Nineveh, a hundred years earlier before this is written, Jonah had gone there, preached the gospel to these wicked people, and the whole entire city of Nineveh repented. It was fantastic. In fact, one of the greatest revivals in the history of the world, but it was short-lived. Assyria would eventually go back to their wayward ways, and uh, they continued to assault the nations. And in 722 BC, they defeated the 10 northern tribes of Israel. God used them as the instrument of judging his people because of their idolatry. After that, they set their sights towards Jerusalem, towards Judea. And of course, through the godly king Hezekiah, God withstood them, stopped them there. Um, but that didn't stop them as a nation. Uh, though they had retreated and 185,000 of them were uh, killed, uh, they continued to grow and uh, the zenith and their prosperity and their wickedness hit, hit that zenith at 660 BC. This is where we come to this passage and God finally says, I'm going to judge you and there will be no escape. So this is what the whole book of Nahum is all about, three chapters of it, so get ready. The burden against Nineveh, of course, that's the capital of Assyria. The book of the vision of Nahum, the Ekloshite. Now, we are not sure if uh, he, this refers to Eklish, this, uh, it's a southern city outside of Judah, possibly that he came from, we're not certain. One thing we know about him is that he was certainly called by God to be a prophet for this time. And he proclaims in verse two, God is jealous and the Lord avenges. The Lord avenges as in, and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries and he reserves wrath for his enemies. And so um, God was going to judge the Assyrians. You're gonna see that quite clearly as we move through here. Nonetheless, as he begins this judgment, he does say this though, but the Lord is slow to anger. Isn't that interesting? So this didn't happen overnight. As I said, a hundred years earlier, they had, you know, uh, revival in the land. And God allowed them to continue in their sin, hoping they would repent once more, that, but they didn't. And so though he's slow to anger, he must judge. And so it continues, he's great in power and will not at all acquit the wicked. 
The Lord has his way in the whirlwind and in the storm and the clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebukes the sea and makes it dry. He dries up all the rivers, Bashan and Carmel wither and the flower of Lebanon melts. The mountains quake before him, the hills melt and the earth heaves at his presence. Yes, the world and all who dwell in it. And again, he's speaking by way of poetic hyperbole of God's mighty power as he comes to judge. Who can stand before his indignation? Who can endure the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire and the rocks are thrown down by him. Now again, that's not the heart of God. God wants all men to repent and come to the knowledge of him, right? 2 Peter 3, 9. In fact, it says in verse 7, the Lord is good and a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knows those who trust him. If you trust him, there is peace, there is protection, there is blessing. But to those who reject him, which was the Assyrians, with an overflowing flood, he will make an utter end of its place, and darkness will pursue his enemies. And so now he will make an utter end of its place. It would be the Babylonians, 612 BC, who would swoop in and really decimate the Assyrians. Uh, listen to this, so devastating. You've never heard of an Assyrian. There's a reason why. First of all, the city of Nineveh was not even discovered until 1842. That's how long, century after century after century, it was decimated and buried. So God's judgment was, was radical. And what do you conspire against the Lord? He'll make an utter end of it. Affliction will not rise up a second time. And while tangled in thorns and while drunken like drunkards, they shall be devoured like stubble fully dried. From you comes forth one who plots evil against the Lord, a wicked counselor. So thus says the Lord, though they are safe and likewise many, though they were a superpower and thought they, you know, no one could touch them. Yet in this manner, they will be cut down when he passes through. Though I have afflicted you, I will afflict you no more. For now I would break off his yoke from you and burst your bonds apart. In other words, there will not be a second chance. This will be it. The Lord has given a command concerning you. Your name shall be perpetuated no longer. Out of the house of your gods, I will cut off the carved image and the molded image. I will dig your grave for you are vile. Behold, on the mountains, the feet of him who brings good tidings, who proclaims peace. O Judah, keep your appointed feast, perform your vows, for the wicked one shall no more pass through you. He is utterly cut off. So uh, though the Assyrians had attempted to come down to Judah, uh, God would protect them. Um, God would bring judgment to them a little bit later on through the Babylonians. And we'll talk about that actually in the next book. But chapter two, he who scatters has come up before your face. Man the fort, watch the road, strengthen your flanks, fortify your power mightily. And so Nahum sees this mighty army coming against Nineveh. For the Lord will restore the excellence of Jacob like the excellence of Israel. For the emptiers have emptied them out and ruined their vine branches. So it was Assyria who emptied out the 10 tribes of Israel of Israel, literally not only destroyed them, but took them captive away and displaced them in other places around the world that they had conquered. But it would be the Babylonians who would then empty the emptiers. That's what he's saying. The shields of his mighty men are made red. The valiant men are in scarlet, speaking of bloodshed. The chariots come with flaming torches in the day of his preparation and the spears are brandished. The chariots rage in the streets. They jostle one another in the broad roads. They seem like torches. They run like lightning. He remembers his nobles. They stumble in their walk. They make haste to her walls and the defense is prepared. So they would, you know, mass up themselves and their defenses. And by the way, Nineveh had massive walls. As see, they thought they were impregnable. Um, but it says in verse six, the gates of the rivers are opened and the palace is dissolved. So interesting enough, when we talked about this when we were in the book of Jonah, we, we have some accurate accounts of what actually happened historically. And first of all, we do know this, that the walls of Nineveh were close to 100 feet high and they were wide enough to have three chariots abroad on the tops of them. They were massive. And not only that, there was a massive moat around the entire city, around these walls. So it's the Greek historian, though, Diodorus, who writes of Nineveh's fall. 
He writes that there was an abnormal, of course, the Lord controls all the elements, an abnormal flooding of the Tigris River. Two of the tributaries flowed into the Tigris and they caused the city walls to swell with the water coming over their banks. Imagine that. And what happened is it washed away a section of the walls of Nineveh two and a half feet long, creating a gaping hole. They became easy pickings for the Babylonians who came in and decimated them. So isn't that interesting in verse six? And by the way, this was written years before Babylon ever came. The gates of the rivers are open and the palace is dissolved. Interesting, right? And it is decreed, verse seven, she shall be led away captive. She shall be brought up and her maidservants shall lead her as with the voice of doves uh, beating their breasts. Though Nineveh of old was like a pool of water, now they flee away. Halt, halt, they cry, but no one turns back. And so God calls out to the Babylonians, take the spoil of silver, take spoil of gold. There is no end of treasure or wealth of every desirable prize. Again, uh, the Assyrians were the dominating world power at that time, but now she's empty and desolate and waste. Her, the heart melts and the knees shake. Much pain is in every side and all their faces are drained of color. Where there is the dwelling of the lions and the feeding place of young lions and where the lion walked and the lioness and the lion's cub and no one made them afraid. Um, if you look at uh, Assyrian architecture and uh, hieroglyphs and so forth, uh, their national symbol was the lion. They had obviously had lions there and everything, but you know, that was decimated. But that's what this is relating to. You called yourself the lion, you had lions, but they're nothing. The lion torn pieces enough for his cubs, killed for his lioness, filled his caves with prey and his dens with flesh. And, and this is how the Assyrians were. They were actually very fierce, but God was bringing away their tyranny. I'm against you, says the Lord of hosts. I will burn your chariots in smoke and the sword shall devour your young lions. I will cut off your prey from the earth and the voice of your messengers shall be heard no more. And it's because of this that then Nahum says in chapter three, woe to the bloody city. It is all full of lies and robbery. It's victims never, it's victim never depart. So God is bringing rapid judgment. The noise of a whip and the noise of rattling wheels, of galloping horses, of clattering chariots, Horsemen charged with bright sword and glittering spear. There is a multitude of slain, a great number of bodies, countless corpses. They stumble over the corpses. Could you imagine? This was a massive city. Um, hundreds of thousands of people lived here. We believe that as we look at the, uh, we talked about this when we were in the book of Jonah. And amass, imagine all these bodies just piled up on top of one another. It's, it's horrible to think of. Because of the multitude of your harlotries, of the seductive harlot, the mistress of sorcerers who sells nations through her harlotries and families through her sorceries. And so obviously they, they practice all types of divination and idolatry. And so God says, behold, I'm against you. I will make you lift your skirts over your face. I will show the nations your nakedness and the kingdoms your shame. So this is a, a, an ancient way of saying, you know, I'm going to make you ashamed before everybody, lifting the skirts over the face. Now, the irony of, of really specifically the Assyrians, so some nations did it as well, is that they would love to record. Wow, that was crazy. Uh, we'll try this one more time. If we get it again, I'll change mics. How's that? Um, I don't have a mic for a backup, so you may want to bring one up here while I'm still talking. How's that? Um, but anyway, the interesting thing about the Assyrians is that they would love to record the cruelty and put it on their monuments of what they did to other people. Peace, people. So let me, I'm just going to share with you. These are from uh, museum pieces of Assyrian uh, plaques and uh, some of their statuettes. It records, we cut off their heads and we formed them into pillars. We flayed the chief men who had revolted and covered their pillars with their skins. We cut off their limbs, the limbs of their officers and 3000 captives we burned with fire and on and on it goes. Can you imagine that? That's pretty radical. Okay, I'm gonna change mics. All right, how's that? Very good. 
Okay, so think about this. So God says, I'm gonna embarrass you in front of the nations because that's exactly what the Assyrians did in a horrific way. He says, I'll show the nations your nakedness, the kingdoms your shame. Verse six, I will cast abominable filth upon you, make you vile and make you a spectacle. It shall come to pass that all who look upon you will flee from you and say, Nineveh is laid waste. Who will bemoan her? Where shall I seek comforters for you? Are you better than Noamon? And that's, that's actually another name for ancient Thebes um, that was situated by the river who had waters around her, whose rampart was the sea, who, whose wall was the sea. Uh, they appeared to be safe, just like the Assyrians. They, were, they felt they were safe by their waterways, as the Assyrians did. But Ethiopia and Egypt were her strength, and it was boundless. Put and Lubin were your helpers. Yet she was carried away. They were conquered. She went into captivity. Her young children also were dashed into pieces at the head of every street. They cast lots for her honorable men, and all her great men were bound in chains. So these places were destroyed. What makes you think you'll be any different? That's what God is saying through the prophet. You also will be drunk. You will be hidden. You also seek refuge from the enemy. But all your stronghold are fig trees, ripened figs. If they are shaken, they fall into the mouth of the eater. So your wickedness is like a ripened fig. You're, you're ripe for judgment is what God is saying. Surely your people in your midst are women. The gates of your land are wide open to the enemies. And of course, that's what happened after the massive flood there. Fire shall devour the bars of your gates. Draw your water for your siege. Fortify your strongholds. Go into the clay and treat the mortar. Make strong the brick kiln. There the fire will devour you. The sword will cut you off. It'll eat you up like locusts. Make yourself many like the locusts. Make yourself many like swarming locusts. In other words, uh, get the brick out. Try and fortify the walls. Try and do everything you can. Do it all, but you're not, it's not going to work. You multiplied your merchants more than the stars of heaven. The locust plunders and flies away. The commanders are like swarming locusts and your generals like great grasshoppers, which camp in the hedges on a cold day when the sun rises, they flee away and the place where they are is not known. Your shepherds slumber. O king of Assyria, your nobles rest in the dust. Your people are scattered on the mountains and no one gathers them. Your injury has no healing. So your judgment is certain. Your wound is severe. All who hear news of you will clap their hands over you. And the reason why is the Assyrians had, had just decimated everyone all the way to the east, all the way moving into the Middle East, even moving down south into Egypt. For upon whom has not your wickedness passed continually? You, you decimated everybody. Everybody's happy when you're gone. So Nahum here prophesies the demise of the Assyrian Empire. Now, it would be about two decades from this time that God would fulfill his word. God always does. I'm sure that they thought for a while, who is this prophet, you know, from the South saying these things to us? He's a nobody, you know, but God surely brought it to pass. And that's what God does when it comes to things even we do. We think we get away with it, but we don't, right? Galatians 6, 7 says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man sows, that he will reap. If we sow to the flesh, if we sow to the things of this world, if we sow to our own, uh, our own appetites, we will of the flesh reap corruption. But if we sow to the spirit, but if we sow to the things of God, if we sow into the kingdom of God, if we have a walk with God, we're walking in the spirit, then we'll of the spirit reap everlasting life. So how important that is. That's really the lesson of Nahum. And a, a radical little book that just, that all it does is talk about judgment against Assyria. But now we come to the book of Habakkuk. Now this has three chapters as well, but Habakkuk deals with the nation of Judah. So this is Judah down to the south. Now he was the contemporary of Jeremiah and Zephaniah. And he prophesied a few decades after Nahum. So think about this. The Babylonians have already then taken Assyria. Um, now, the fall of Israel had already taken place. Assyria did that. But Syria had been eventually vanquished by the Babylonians. Now, Habakkuk was well aware of the consequences of sin. Now, he had grown up under the leadership of Josiah, a very godly king. 
He had experienced when he was a young boy, a good king who governed Judah and they served the Lord. But the present king in 2 Kings 23 and verse 37, the current king was King Jehoiakim. And it tells us he did evil in the sight of the Lord. And so now during his days of being a prophet, the nation of Judah is taking a tailspin. There will only be two more kings after this king. Both of them will be wicked and God will bring the Babylonians. So God gives him a unique vision concerning the future punishment of their waywardness. And not only would it send shockwaves to the nation, it would definitely shake Habakkuk up as well. We're gonna see that in chapter three. Now, Habakkuk is a prophet. He's a man of God. He knows that his nation deserves punishment, much as we know our nation deserves punishment, right? We, we kind of know that. And God has already told him that punishment is inevitable. So he understands that. What really put Habakkuk in a, in a tailspin for a time was that he couldn't understand the vehicle or the means by which he would bring the punishment. Now, first of all, his name means one who embraces or one who clings. And, and we see at the end of the book, he, he lives up to his name. God gives him the future insight as to the devastation of his people. He didn't quite grasp it, but here's what he does. He clings to God. And that's what God wants us to do in those times we don't understand why he's doing it, who he's doing it through, why we cling to God. So keep that in mind as we look at this book. We come to chapter one and we read the burden which the prophet Habakkuk saw. Oh Lord, how long shall I cry and you will not hear? Even cry out to you, there's violence. Will you not save? Now, Habakkuk is a prophet, he's a man of God, and he's crying concerning the evil of his day, much like we do. Lord, why, why so much evil in our land? And, and Habakkuk is saying, God, why don't you do something about it? There's violence. Will you not save? Will you not stop this? Why do you show me iniquity and cause me to see trouble? For plundering and violence is before me. There's strife, there's contention, it arises. God, everywhere I look, there's sin. Therefore, the law is powerless. No one wants to follow the law, so what good is it? And justice never goes forth, for the wicked surround the righteous. Therefore, perverse judgment proceeds. I think this is the day and age in which we live. We can relate to that. But here's the thing. Habakkuk assumed that God was inactive. God's Habakkuk's saying, well, God, why aren't you doing something? You must be just sitting up in heaven doing nothing. You're inactive. But God speaks to him in verse five. He says, look among the nations and watch. Be utterly astounded, for I will work a work in your days which you would not believe though it were told you. So first of all, he's saying, I am not inactive. I'm at work. And we know that, first of all, God is patient, isn't he? Thank the Lord for that. I'm thankful that he's patient with our nation. God is not willing that any perish, but all come to repentance, 2 Peter 3, 9. God had been waiting. God had been patient. But he says, listen, I'm gonna do a work in your day. It's gonna astound you. You're not even going to believe it, though it's gonna happen, it's true. And here it is. For indeed, I'm raising up the Chaldeans. That's the Babylonians. I'm raising up a bitter and hasty nation which marches through the breadth of the earth to possess dwelling places that are not theirs. They are terrible and they're dreadful. Their judgment and their dignity proceed from themselves. Their horses are swifter than leopards and more fierce than evening wolves. Their chargers charge ahead. Their cavalry comes from afar. They fly as an eagle that hastens to eat. Again, using descriptive poetry. He's just trying to describe, um, using a little hyperbole here of the fierceness of Babylon. They'll come for violence, verse nine. Their faces are set against the east wind. They gather captives like sand. They scoff at kings and princes are scorned by them. They deride every stronghold and they heap up earthen mounds to seize it. So that's how they take a city. They just set a siege mound around it. They take their time, they choke them out. That's what you did in ancient warfare and they take them. Then his mind changes and he transgresses. He commits offense, ascribing this power to his God. They're a fierce nation and they all do it to their false God, just like the Assyrians did. But here's what God is telling Habakkuk here. I'm gonna allow this. 
Now, a little about the Babylonians. They, they came to rise under the power, under the rule of Nabo or Nabo Pelezer. And uh, we mentioned them in the book of Nahum. And he's the one who conquered the Assyrian Empire in 612 BC. Now, that was right at the beginning of this king right now, Jehoiakim's rule in Judah. However, during the middle of his rule in 605 BC, uh, Nebuchadnezzar became the man in power. We're familiar with him, right? Of Daniel, right? It was under his rule then, under Nebuchadnezzar, that Jerusalem is destroyed, the temple is destroyed, the king's palace, everything is decimated, the people are taken captive to Babylon. So God tells Habakkuk, don't worry about the injustices you see because I'm bringing the Babylonians. Now Habakkuk responds to this in verse 12. Are you not from everlasting, O my Lord God, my Holy One? We shall not die, O Lord. You've appointed them for judgment, O rock. You've marked them for correction. Oh God, you must have it wrong. They're pagan. You're gonna judge them, you mean. I mean, judgment's coming to those guys. We're, we, we serve the one true God. He, he, he couldn't understand this. And not only that, God, you're of purer eyes than to behold evil. You can't look on wickedness. You're holy. You're gonna, you're, you're gonna see that we love you. Why do you look on those who deal treacherously and hold your tongue when the wicked devours a person more righteous than he? Lord, we're, we're more righteous than they are. Yes, we've done things wrong. Yes, I'm saying we should be judged, but you're gonna use them, do you see? Why do you make them like fish of the sea, like creeping things that have no ruler over them? They take up all of them with a hook. They catch them in their net. They gather them in their dragnet. Therefore, they rejoice and are glad. Therefore, they sacrifice to their net and burn incense to their dragnet because by them their snare, their share, I should say, is sumptuous and food plentiful. Shall they therefore empty their net and continue to slay nations without pity? So they're this ungodly pagan nation and, and they like gobble up nations like, like fishermen throw a fishing net into the sea. They take up another one, they worship their God, thank it, and they do it again and again and again. And to Habakkuk, it makes no sense. He's shocked. Now, this is, I think, many times one of our problems. Like Habakkuk, we, we make assumptions. We assume that God must work in a certain or particular way. And when God doesn't, it kind of throws us back or we actually get upset with God. We expect God to work one way or at least do it in a way we understand or comprehend. And if God doesn't do it that way, we get a little frustrated. God, you should have worked this way. No, this needs to be remedied, not that, you know. And so we look for God to work in our time, in our way, according to our plan. And when God doesn't, we're mad, we're frustrated or we're devastated. Many, many responses can come from that. So never in a million years did Habakkuk think that God would use a vile, idolatrous nation to discipline the people of God. And so this threw a wrench into his theology and how he thought God should operate, you know. And again, we often do that. We think God should work a, a certain way and, and we, we limit God. And when we limit God, we set ourselves up for frustration for disappointment. God is always at work. First of all, he's never inactive. He's always at work. And whatever God does allow is always for our good, Romans 8, 28. And it's always to bring him glory. That doesn't mean it won't bring us pain because in that process of pain, we also learn to trust him more. And maybe there, just maybe there are some things that need to get out of our life, right? Now we come to chapter two and Habakkuk says, I will stand watch and set myself on the rampart and I'll watch to see what he will say to me and what I will answer when I am corrected. So Habakkuk knew that he had probably said too much. He, he knows that he's gonna be corrected. And so I think this is good. And rather than march off and huff off because of God's revelation and because it made no sense to him, he goes up on the rampart. You know, he goes on the upper part of the wall, the watchman on the wall, up high, you know. And there he waits for further instruction. Now, in reality, this is a very good response. You see, when things don't make sense, when life throws us a curveball, which happens all the time, 
When everything seems confusing to us, we really have one of two choices. One, we can jump to the wrong conclusions and in doing so get mad at God, abandon God, you don't care about me, God. Or we can climb above our circumstances and put our trust in God, which by the way, Habakkuk does in chapter three, and say, God, you're in control. You see, history is really his story. And he knows the end from the beginning. All of life flows through a channel cut by God. We need to remember that. As a believer, I need to remind myself of that. And here's the great thing. Nothing happens in my life, but it first must pass through our Father filter. And I'm so thankful for that. Because he is gracious in what punishment or chastening or trial he allows in my life. God's not surprised. He's not shocked when things happen. He's allowed it. He's designed it for my good, for his glory. And so I have a, a, a choice. I can either jump to the wrong conclusions or I can climb on God's shoulders and his wisdom and his plan. His plan is far superior to mine, for sure. So I think this verse here really shows us four things that I think that are very helpful when seeking God's perspective. I just kind of jotted these down and I, I, maybe they'll be helpful for you. I think the first thing is, I, I love the fact that in here there was determination by Habakkuk, determination. He says, I will stand my watch and I will set myself on the rampart. The implication here is he's going to get away with God and he's not gonna move until he hears from the Lord. I think a lot of times we will we'll slow down, we'll stop, we'll pray, but if we don't hear from God for a few hours or a couple days, you know, we give up. I think Habakkuk was determined, I'm going up to the rampart, I'm gonna get alone with God and I'm staying there until I have the heart of God, until I know what he wants to say. I think the second thing is not only was he determined, he's obviously isolated, there's isolation. And I think this is so good that when we do get away, it's we get away to a place where there's no noise, no hustle, no bustle. Here he climbs on top of a wall. For us, maybe it's getting up early in the morning. Some things trouble you. I've found that when I have things going on in my life, God automatically wakes me up earlier. Or he keeps me up at night and I have to get away and I have to go in another room where it's quiet and I can hear from God. You see, when I'm on my job or I'm around my family or we've all got responsibilities, it's hard to hear from God. It's important that we get away. I think it's something we should do on a regular basis so that we're really tied in with God all the time. So we're not just coming to him in case of emergency. I think that's something we should be doing all the time. There should be that time of isolation. I, I think number three, he came to the Lord with expectation because he says in verse one, I will watch to see what he will say to me. He expected God over a period of time to communicate to him. I love that. There was an anticipation. He knows that God is faithful. And I think we need to realize that, that if we faithfully get away with God and we got things troubling us, God is faithful. God will speak to us. He'll speak to us from his word. He'll speak to our hearts through prayer. He's speaking to us through the circumstances. God will. I think the last thing is there was humiliation here. He was humble. I say that because at the end of verse one, he says, now I know I'll be corrected. You know, he came and go, I, I probably, you know, I, I, I probably need to be corrected because I was pretty upset with God, you know. He knows that. And it's just a good reminder for us that when we come into God's, prom, uh, God's presence, we remind him, so, ourselves, he's God, we're not. He's the teacher, I'm the student. He's the father, I'm the child, Right? He came in humility. He wanted to hear. He wanted to learn. He wanted to submit. He was willing to do that. So I think all those principles are good ones. So here's Habakkuk. He's alone. He's on top of the rampart, anticipating God speaking. And the Lord did answer him, verse 2. And he said, write the vision and make it plain on tablets that he may run who reads it. So it'll be plain to everybody what's going to happen. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end, it will speak. It'll happen. It will not lie. Though it tarries, though it doesn't happen right now, wait for it because it will surely come. I will not or it will not tarry. So I want you to write this down and we have it recorded for us exactly what happened. I want you to write it down so that you can know what to do. So you could see, there it is, plain as day. God said this would happen. It's gonna happen. Now I love that he says this in regard to the vision he received. I think it's good for us to do 
Um, when, we, when God gives us a vision for important things, I think it's good for us to write those things down that God does communicate to us. Um, I took that seriously. When God gave us a vision as a church, I, I know I wrote that down. I felt God was saying, here's the vision I'm giving for you when you start a church. I want you to worship me. I want you to win people to Christ. I want you to disciple people in my word. And I want you to be a place where people are equipped and they go out. Worship, win, disciple, sin. I said, okay, Lord. So he, he told me to write that down. I did. I didn't forget that. And now I write it down all the time so other people can understand what it is. It's in our bulletins, our literature. It's everywhere, right? It's not complicated. It's not hard that someone can't understand what our vision is. So it's important that we do that, that we make it very clear. We've done that. We did that as a church. But God said to, to Habakkuk, you do this with this vision. You make it very clear and simple so everybody sees what I'm saying. And he did. Now, moving on, um, he speaks against the proud. Behold, the proud, his soul is not upright in him. A proud man lives for himself. He lives by his senses, what he sees, what he feels, what he wants, what he desires. But, and here we have this great statement, the just shall live by his faith. Now, keep in mind, God had already told Habakkuk what he was gonna do, and Habakkuk was li living by sight. He, he knew, he saw, he knew all about the, the paganism, the Chaldeans. He said, no way, not them, not them. He was looking for what he saw with human eyes. Not only that, he was looking at the situation through human logic. God, this doesn't make sense. You can't, it doesn't make sense. And I think he also was looking at the situation through his human emotion. Oh, this is not, this is not good. I, I, and it, it caused him to be fearful. In fact, we're going to see that in the next chapter. It, it, it struck him in his very physical stature. He was shaking because of it. So at first, it didn't look right. It didn't seem right. It didn't feel right. But here's the thing. People without the Lord, that's how they live. They live by sight, what looks good. They live by logic, how it works out. Hmm, I think this is the way we should do it. They, they live by their emotion, by their feelings, but not the believer. We live by faith. We need to live by faith. We don't live by what we see with our eyes, man. We, I mean, that our, this, this world will deceive us all the time. We don't live by our human logic. Our humanness will fail us all the time. And we certainly don't go by our emotions, how we feel. Are you kidding? We feel different every other day. We need to base ourselves on God's word and what he says. This is an invaluable lesson. This is a huge, in fact, th this was, if you think of the Apostle Paul, you could say this was really the Apostle Paul's life verse right here from Habakkuk because he quotes it three times. Romans 1, Galatians 3, Hebrews chapter 10. The just live by faith. So this is something that should not only be underlined in our Bibles, should be underlined in our, in our hearts. We, we live, we walk by faith. And some things are not gonna make sense. It's okay. We trust God. Now, he continues to talk about the proud man. Indeed, because he transgresses by wine, he's a proud man. And he does not stay at home because he enlarges his desire as hell. And he, he is like death and cannot be satisfied. He gathers to himself all nations and heaps up for himself all people. Uh, will he not take up, uh, uh, will not all these take up a proverb against him? and a taunting riddle against him who say, woe to him who increases what is not his, how long? And to him who loads himself with many pledges, will not your creditors rise up suddenly? Will they not awaken who oppress you? And will you become their booty because they have plundered many nations? And again, he's referring to the proud man as really is typifying the whole nation of Babylon. And then he says this, because you have plundered many nations and all the remnant of the people. Now, that refers to the future remnant of Israel or of Judah, I should say. All the remnant of the people shall plunder you because of men's blood and the violence of the land and the city and all who dwell in it. So God would eventually, though they would be attacked and taken away captive to Babylon 70 years, but God would restore a remnant and God would eventually bring the Babylonians down. Now, in the remainder of this chapter, he gives four woes concerning those who choose sin. First, verses 9 through 11, woe to the greedy. Woe to him who covets evil, evil gain for his house, that he may set his nest on high, that he may be delivered from the power of disaster. You give shameful counsel to your house, cutting off many peoples and sin against your soul. For the stone shall cry out from the wall and the beam from the timbers will answer it. 
So Habakkuk pictures a beautiful house built by a greedy person, but inevitably it comes down with the very stones crying out against it. Then secondly, in verses 12 through 14, woe to the violent. Woe to him who builds a town with bloodshed, who establishes a city by iniquity, which, by the way, was the MO of the Babylonians. Behold, it is not of the Lord of hosts that the peoples labor to feed the fire and nations weary themselves in vain. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the water covers the sea. And so God will judge the violent and in the kingdom establish his glory in the earth. Then in verses 15 through 17, the third woe, woe to the drunk. Woe to him who gives drink to his neighbor, pressing him to your bottle, even to make him drunk that you may look on his nakedness. You are filled with shame instead of glory. You also drink and be exposed as uncircumcised. The cup of the Lord's right hand will be turned against you and utter shame will be your glory. And so it just uh, it talks about the, the shame that drunkenness can bring. By the way, uh, some statistics I came across when I was putting this study together. Um, right now, alcohol is responsible for 100,000 deaths a year, 25,000 by drunk drivers alone. And then it says, then there are 6 million non-fatal injuries that alcoholism brings. More than 100 billion in economic losses, such as unemployment and loss of productivity. Ain't nothing good comes out of alcohol. Then uh, Habakkuk continues to prophesy against Babylon for the violence done to Lebanon to cover you and to plunder the beasts which made them afraid because of men's blood and the violence of the land of the city and because all who dwell in it. So, of course, they made their way south and they took Lebanon, which is just south of Jerusalem. And then inevitably they made themselves all the way down to Judah. Then there's a fourth woe, the final one. Woe to the idolater in verses 18 through 20. And he begins by asking a question. What profit is an image, an idol, that its maker should carve it? The mold, molded image, a teacher of lies, that the maker of its mold should trust in it to make mute idols? I mean, you think about a carved image. It can't hear anything, can't say anything, and it can't do anything. So this fourth woe, woe to him who says to wood, you know, wooden idol. Arise, awake, you know, to a silent stone, one made of stone. Arise, it shall teach. Behold, it's overlaid with gold and silver, yet in it there is no breath at all. Those who worship idols, how foolish, right? How foolish. The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord can hear. The Lord can help. The Lord can respond. Let all the earth keep silent before him. He's the one true living God. Now, when we read about someone carving a piece of wood or stone, we go, man, that's so foolish. That's so dumb. And then we don't look at the idols we have in our lives, right? We got idols like, man, my house, I, my house is so beautiful. It's awesome. I don't know if we say that, but we do put a lot of stock in our house or our cars. Some people do worship their car. I mean, they spend all weekend polishing it, taking care of it. It's got a little speck of dust in it. I'm definitely not a car worshiper, that's for sure. My car is filthy on the inside and the outside. But we have all kinds of idols. It could be our phone, it could be social media, it could be a career, it could be a relationship, so many things. So this is a good warning to all of us. Woe to the greed of the violent, the drunk, and the idolater. Now, chapter three, and it begins with a brief prayer, a prayer of Habakkuk the prophet on Shigaloth. Now, that's a musical notation. So this vision was put to music, and it actually says that at the end as well, interesting enough. But he prays, oh, Lord, I've heard your speech, and I was afraid. So he's crying out to God. He says, Lord, when you first told me your plan for bringing the Babylonians, I, I was afraid. Oh, Lord, revive your work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make it known. In other words, do as you desire, Lord. However, in wrath. Remember mercy. Isn't that good? I, I like Habakkuk. He's acquiescing to God's divine plan, but he's asking for mercy. And of course, God is long-suffering. He is patient. He is merciful. But he is also just in punishing sin. So he just offers this brief prayer, and God gives him a vision of his glory and power from verses 3 to 15. God came from Timon, the Holy One from Mount Paran, 
So uh, Mount Paran and Timon are, are, are in the areas in the south. And so these were areas actually where God revealed his glory to Moses. So he, he sees God's glory coming, you know. And his glory covered the heavens, and the earth was full of his praise. His brightness was like the light. He had rays flashing from his hand, and there was uh, his power was not hidden. So he, he's describing someone in this vision of God's glory, something of what Ezekiel saw and John saw, the glorious power of God and his glory. Before him went pestilence. Fever followed at his feet. He stood and measured the earth. He looked and startled the nations and the everlasting mountains were scattered. The perpetual hills bowed. His ways are everlasting. He's just now extolling the greatness of God. I saw tents in Kushan in affliction. The curtains of the land of Midian trembled. O Lord, you were displeased with the rivers. Was your anger against the rivers? Was your wrath against the sea that you rode on your horses, your chariots of salvation? Your bow was made quite ready. Oaths were sworn over your arrows. You divided the earth with rivers. The mountains saw you and trembled. The overflowing of the water passed by. The deep uttered its voice and lifted its hands on high. The sun and the moon stood still in their habitation. At the light of your arrows they went, at the shining of your glittering spear. You marched through the land in indignation and trampled the nations in anger. So he sees God on the march, you know, in anger. And God will judge his people through the Babylonians, of course. But you went forth for the salvation of your people. For salvation with your anointed, you struck the head from the house of the wicked by laying bare the foundation to the neck. So though God is powerful to judge, he's also mighty to save. And he would save a remnant through all this. You thrust through with your arrows the head of the villages. They came out like a whirlwind to scatter me. The rejoicing was like feasting on a poor on the poor in secret, and you walk through the sea with your horses through the heap of great waters. So just in this vision, Habakkuk is allowed to see God's great glory. And he realizes again in this whole time that he's had with God that God is going to, you know, do as he said. He's going to judge the people. Now, he realizes that back in chapter 2 and verse 4, he did say the just live by faith. So as he concludes this book and this vision, he, he writes one of the greatest declarations of that faith in all of the Bible. Now notice how he begins, first of all. He reminds us how he felt physically when he got the news that God was bringing the Babylonians. When I heard, my body trembled. My lips quivered at the voice. Rottenness entered my bones. I trembled in myself that I might rest in the day of trouble. When he comes up to the people, he will invade them with his troops. So basically, when he, he first heard the Babylonians were gonna invade Jerusalem with their troops, he says, my body trembled. I, I literally physically was shaking. My lips quivered at the voice. So I, I couldn't even control my facial muscles rottenness entered my bones. So I felt sick. I felt like I was being punched in the stomach, you know, and I trembled in myself. So he was affected outwardly and inwardly. And you know, there are probably times where maybe you can relate to this. Maybe you've heard bad news. You, something happened and you got news and it you you could relate to that. Maybe you got the news that a loved one had just passed away in an accident. Or you found out that the first time a loved one got cancer. And, and that same feeling, you, you begin to shake, you lose control. You feel like someone has punched you in the stomach. And you think, why, God, why have you allowed this? Why, why is this happening? And this was Habakkuk's initial response. But here's the thing, as he's writing what he responded at first, he's now had time to assimilate this, spend time with God, get the perspective. And so now he writes this incredible statement. He responds, though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, though the labor of the olive may fail and the fields yield no food, though the flock may be cut off from the fold and there be no herd in the stall. So Lord, though you may bring the Babylonians and take everything away, our land, our livelihood, the people. You take, you strip us down to nothing. Yet, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. Can you imagine that? 
Here's a man who says, I'm not gonna look at what I see, what I feel, but I've learned I have to walk by faith. And I know that God has a plan in this. And though you take everything away, I'm still gonna praise you. This is very similar to what Job wrote. Remember we went through the book of Job, chapter one and verse 21, after he hears about losing you know, uh, his servants, his children, everything he owned. He said, the Lord gave, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. This was Habakkuk in, in the midst of such overwhelming information. He chooses to put the tr his trust in the Lord. Why? Because the Lord, verse 19, is my strength. And he will make my feet like a deer's feet. And he will make me walk on high heels. So no matter how difficult it gets, God's going to sustain me. I'm going to be like a deer that's on the top of those mountaintops. We don't even know how they stay there. They don't slip. They're sure-footed. God protects them. God is with them. God, I won't slip. God, I won't fall. You'll protect me. And then again, as I said, this was to put to music. The chief musician with stringed instruments. But as we close, my, my prayer is this, is that we do as Habakkuk does, because here at the end of trusting God, because we often do what he does at first. Why are you doing this? This doesn't compute. How could you allow this, you know? And we have that choice. We can either choose to get upset with God or we can climb to higher ground, get away with God, seek God. Say, Lord, what are you doing? I know that you're never gonna disappoint me. You always have a plan for my life, for my good. In fact, you, you might be here tonight and you're worried about tomorrow. Can I remind you about yesterday? Yesterday, I've, God obviously took care of you. Why? Because you're here today. And right now, God's taking care of you. So guess what? He's gonna be there tomorrow. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. God is faithful. He makes no, mis no mistakes. Amen? Let's pray, Lord.